So our next presenter today will be Dr. Gwendolyn McGinnis. She is the non-human primate field specialist for USDA APHIS Animal Care. And today she'll be talking about non-human primate transportation. Please put your hands together for Gwen. Good morning. I'm here to talk about non-human primate transportation. And before anybody gets started in non-human primate transportation, they really should understand the regulatory oversight regulatory agencies that do have an interest. Um, USDA, obviously animal care, we're talking about animal welfare today, and the Animal Welfare Act does have provisions for the humane handling and care during transportation. Um, veterinary services is also interested in the transport of non-human primates, primarily from the spread of, um, concern about the spread of communicable animal diseases. And they also oversee the veterinary accreditation program, which plays a role in animal transport. Fish and Wildlife Service is interested in the movement of animals covered under the Endangered Species Act. So they're going to have some requirements. Department of Transportation through their Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration um, has an interest in um, the transport of hazardous materials. And that would include uh, primates that carry hazardous materials or hazardous agents. And then um, also the state animal health and public health departments. And it's, it's at the state level where a lot of the testing requirements are set for, um, for approval for transportation. Uh, I mentioned the accredited veterinarian program. In most cases, it, to be able to transport a non-human primate, a signature from an accredited veterinarian verifying the health of the the primate is required for transport. And accredited veterinarians are legally accountable to multiple federal and state agencies for documents that bear their signature and the content on those documents as well. And they're also required to know all of the appropriate regulations and guidelines and all the reporting requirements too for different um, disease agents. And then the activities that accredited veterinarians perform may include, but aren't limited to doing those health inspections prior to transport, ensuring that the required testing um, needs are met, completing the, those health cert certifications, and then providing any other documentation as needed. And again, the Animal Welfare Act has specific requirements um, requiring uh, health certification for non-human primates. They must be issued by a veterinarian no more than 10 days before transport. Uh, we have requirements regarding ambient temperature, enclosure design, provision of food and water, observation and handling. Also, as uh, Dr. Silverano talked about yesterday, contingencies are very important. And some specific contingencies to consider when it comes to transport include things like delays in shipments, because whenever there's travel, delays are definitely a potential. Um, so are there places where the animals can be held that have the appropriate environmental controls? And is there enough food and water to get them through the entire transport if delays happen? Another con contingency to consider are extreme temperature or weather conditions. In 2021, we had a very large shipment of non-human primates arrive at an airport and the ambient temperature was negative 10 degrees. And it was two different shipments. So they had to offload all the primates and they were out on the tarmac. And um, then they had to identify and separate the two different shipments to make sure that the right monkeys were going with the right ground transporter. And then they were loaded up on the truck and that took about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes, and they were out exposed to these temperatures. So they needed to have a contingency to do better. And now that airport um, has a warehouse. And so they, when the weather's really cold, they'll drive the pallets into, the, into a warehouse where the animals are protected and they're able to load in better conditions. Uh, enclosure damage or animal escapes. They're primates, they, they're destructive. Um, and in 2018, we had a primate escape during transport. So, I mean, this does happen. And if, if they escape because their, their enclosure gets damaged, do you have an extra enclosure on hand to put them in? You may be able to catch them, but what are you gonna do with them once you catch them? You gotta be able to put them somewhere. Also, you wanna have the capture equipment to catch them. Or there may be a vehicle breakdown or accident. 
in 20, oh, drove too fast. In 2022, there was, a, there was a vehicle accident. And when you're traveling in vehicles, accidents are a potential. I mean, it doesn't have to be the driver's fault for an accident to occur. Um, so you should have contingencies in place and your driver should know what they need to do should that occur. And ideally the driver should stay with the vehicle or the animals um, and they should have access to a phone number that, that's a 24 hour phone number where they can contact someone to help them out. Um, yesterday, Dr. Dold talked about having a calling tree. I think that's a great idea because then your driver can contact the calling tree and then they can focus on dealing with what's going on at the accident site and deal with monitoring the animals. And then somebody else can take care of getting uh, another driver, another vehicle, take care of the other stuff. So it kind of frees up the driver having a calling tree. That, that was a great idea. Um, also, this is another example, I think, when it's a good idea to have those wild animal stickers instead of the live animal stickers. The regulations do, do say that it can be either live animal or wild animal. Um, these said live animal, and there was a woman who stopped by the, the site and thought they were cats and was sticking her fingers in the enclosures and um, then was afraid that she had contracted B virus and it was a whole big to do. So um, things that it, it, would, it would be good to mark them in a way that doesn't invite people to come wanna touch the monkeys. And then of course, anytime there's a death in transit, it's always good to try to identify the cause of death. If it's something that's related to transit, whether it's um, a temperature issue or an exhaust issue or anything else. And, and that way, um, if you identify what caused it, then maybe it's something you can mitigate in route and not have additional deaths on the way to your destination. State oversight is a little bit tricky because each state kind of has their own um, different agency that manages this. Um, and then there's also some different anti-cruelty and prohibited species laws that come into play. And then there are also community, I mean, county and local municipal laws as well. So it, all these things can impact what is permissible when it comes to transporting non-human primates. And then on top of all that, these requirements can change frequently. So it's really important to check with the state that the animal is traveling to, to make sure that you, you're meeting all the requirements prior to transport. And the best way to do that is to contact the receiving state's Department of Animal Health or Public Health. And these two sites here are the two sites that give you the, um, the right contact information for who to reach out to to find out what needs to be in place before those animals are transported. I see people taking pictures, so I'm gonna take a minute to let them capture. Okay. Now, when it comes to importation, there's additional requirements. And definitely CDC is gonna play a very, very big role um, through their Division of Global Mig Migration and Quarantine. And um, their role is in preventing the um, transmission spread uh, and spread of communicable diseases from foreign countries. And with primates being so closely related to humans, diseases that they would carry are gonna be more likely to be zoonotic. USDA's role is gonna be the same. US Fish and Wildlife's role is um, gonna be a little bit increased because they, um, Fish and Wildlife is the group that issues the, the import permits through their Office of Law Enforcement, and then also the Division of Management Authority issues CITES permits. So um, both are required for import. So you would need to be working with the Office of Fish and Wildlife to import non-human primates. And then of course, Customs and Border Patrol monitors the transit of all materials across the US borders. Importation of non-human primates, primates is strictly controlled by CDC. Um, and um, for certain primates, clearance through fish and wildlife may also be required. Advanced notification to CDC is important so that they can coordinate uh, with the different agencies um, to make sure everything's all set prior to arrival. Uh, and they can only come in through certain ports of entry. Um, and those are the ports of entries that have CDC quarantine staff. And they also meet clearance requirements. 
Um, and then there are shipments that also there are shipments that also fall under Fish and Wildlife Authority, and those must meet some additional requirements for crating, caging, and transporting non-human primates, and also must establish, implement, maintain, and adhere to standard operating procedures in order to do the transporting. CITES is, I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with CITES, um, but it's, a, it's an international treaty um, for protecting uh, endangered plants and animal species. And the, um, species, the species that are protected under CITES are, are organized into three different appendices. Non-human primates are all listed under appendix one and two. Um, and so because they're all listed, uh, CITES permits are required for international import and export of non-human primates. When the primates arrive at the port of entry, uh, Customs and Border Patrol secure the carrier, and they are going to ensure that the animals remain on board um, until CDC or Fish and Wildlife are present. Um, usually, CDC and Fish and Wildlife are present before the shipment even arrives. Um, and then they ensure that all entry requirements, including the required paperwork, uh, is completed and valid. And then um, Fish and Wildlife clearance has to be obtained before Customs and Border Patrol clearance um, for the shipment to be able to leave the bonded area. And the fish and wildlife requirements include requiring the animals arrive in the US alive, healthy, and uninjured. CDC has additional oversight role during um, the unloading of non-human primates. They, they monitor the unloading very closely. They ensure that everybody who's involved and in close contact with the primates are wearing the appropriate PPE. They assure that there's no contamination of adjacent cargo. They monitor disinfection of the aircraft and also the areas where the primates are, are held. And then they assure that there's no dead or ill non-human primates in the shipment. So that's all the regulatory landscape. And if it still sounds like a good idea to, do, to ship non-human primates with all that going on, the next step is to plan the journey. And uh, while as we said yesterday, it's not required to have a journey plan. It is definitely a good idea. And a lot of things to consider include the, the length of travel. It's important to know how long you're gonna travel because you need to know how much food and water to pack. And you need to know how many stops you're gonna be making in order to check on their, their health. And you need to know, it's helpful to know where, it's good, where it would be good to have a stop. What sort of resources do you need? Um, what are the weather conditions? What are the road conditions? Are there tolls and fees that your driver needs to contend with? Do you have enough people and equipment for the unloading and loading of the animals? Um, have you identified alternate routes if you need to, if, if there are conditions that make you need to take an alternate route? Do you have capture equipment? And I mentioned extra food and water. We mentioned veterinarians. We talked about veterinarians a lot. Are there, are there veterinary contacts you have that you can reach out to along the way if you, if you have an animal that needs attention? immediately, and then other important contact information as well. And these are all the things that the person driving the vehicle needs to know. So it's either going to be your personnel, or if you're a one person show, it's going to be you, you need to know these things, you need to know what are the responsibilities um, of the shipper or carrier of that animal. How do you inspect the primary enclosures? What are the things you're looking for? What things need to be in place? What is the required documentation? Um, what is the appropriate requirements for handling and delivery? What are the species specific husbandry requirements? How do you care for these animals while they're in your possession? Um, and then you should be able to identify some basic physiologic signs of illness or distress and know when it's time to reach out to a veterinarian um, and get help. And these, they include things like an increased respiratory rate, excessive shivering or huddling, aggressive interactions or injuries associated with fighting, dehydration, and so on and so forth. And then it's also important that they know emergency procedures because those are things that tend to need to be implemented in a very reactive way. You don't have, when an emergency occurs, you don't have time to sit there and read the manual. You need to know what to do next. So when it comes to the carrier and handler responsibility, before they even accept the non-human primate for transport, the re regulations require that they make sure that these, re these requirements are, are met. 
they need to make sure that the enclosures meet the regulatory requirements for construction, space, and capacity. They need to also be free of obvious defects. They need to make sure that all required documentation has been prepared and is attached to the enclosure. And they need to also make sure that their holding areas where they're gonna be holding the non-human primates can meet the temperature requirements, which are 45 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. There is, however, an allowance in the regulations that allow facilities to hold primates at lower temperatures if there's a certificate of acclimation. So let's talk about what those enclosures have to look like. Well, they need to be strong enough to contain the animals securely and withstand the rigors of transportation. They need to be constructed of materials and treated and or treated with materials that are non-toxic. You need to be able to open the enclosure quickly in the case of an emergency, but then they also need to be secured with an animal proof device because primates are really good at opening their own enclosures if they're able to. And then they need to have that sticker that we talked about um, on the top and at least one side marked with either live animals or wild animals. Again, the letters need to be at least one inch high and with arrows indicating the correct upright position of the enclosure. We wanna see those projecting rims that help protect the ventilation spaces. And we also wanna see handles or handholds that allow the crate to be lifted without tilting it. And also very important, those ventilation openings um, that are covered with bars, wire mesh, or smooth expanded metal with air spaces. And talking a little bit more about the ventilation openings, we do have requirements about how big they're supposed to be to make sure that the primates are getting enough ventilation. If the openings are just on two opposite sides of the enclosure, they need to be at least 16% of the surface area. If they're on all four sides of the enclosure, they need to be at least 8% of the surface area. And then in some instances where the enclosures are permanently affixed within the conveyance and they just have the one um, surface that can be used for ventilation, that needs to be at least 90% of the surface area is ventilation. And um, to calculate that percentage, you, all you do is you, you take the, um, the surface area of the ventilation space and divide it by the surface area of the side of the enclosure. So that would be like the, the width of the, of the ventilation area times the height divided by the width of the side times the height. And then you multiply it times 100 to get the percent. In addition to the size of the ventilation opening, it's also a requirement that the ventilation opening is above the midline of the enclosure. Now inside the enclosure, there's also some requirements. The inside needs to be big enough so that the primate has enough space to move around normally and sit without its head touching the top of the enclosure. They also need to be unable to put any part of their body outside of the enclosure. And this is probably the thing that, that gets cited the most. Um, we have people who transport non-human primates in dog crates pretty, that's what we kind of see most often. And, and the openings in the dog crates are big enough for primates to stick their fingers and hands out. And so they don't meet regulatory requirements. They actually need a relatively fine mesh over those ventilation spaces to make sure that they can't put parts of their body outside of their enclosure. The inside of the enclosure should not have any sharp points or edges or protrusions that could injure the primate. The floor needs to be either a solid floor or a raised mesh floor or slatted floor with a tray underneath. Um, if it is a raised floor, the animal shouldn't be able to put any part of their body through the raised floor. And then they should also be provided with enough litter to cover and absorb excreta. The bottom also needs to be leak proof so that waste products are, don't seep out from the bottom of the enclosure and they stay contained within the enclosure. And then if we convert this to the inside of the door instead of the outside of the door, you can see the feet cups there. Food and water receptacles need to be attached to the inside of the enclosure and they need to be placed so that they can be filled without opening the cage door. And a lot of times having an opening big enough to put food through is big enough to put a primate's 
hand or fingers through. So a lot of times um, the feed openings are covered with a piece of wood, either a small sliding piece of wood. This is a hinged piece of wood um, that is in place in an actual transport enclosure and you lift it up and then you can access those openings to feed the primates and put it down and the primates are once again secure for transport. In terms of capacity in general, just one primate per enclosure, um, but there are some exceptions. Um, the regulations do allow the transportation of a mother and her nursing infant to be transported together. They also allow a male female pair or family group to be transported together, provided that the female is not an estrus or a compatible pair of juvenile of the same juveniles of the same species may also be transported in the same enclosure together. The regulations also specify that primates of different species may not be transported together in the same enclosure or in adjacent enclo enclosures. Carriers are, are expected to make sure that the animals are traveling with the required documentation. The documentation needs to be securely attached to the outside of the primary enclosure. It needs to be attached in a way that it is easily identified and also accessible. Um, so that means you can take it out and look at the documents and put them back in. And they can't be taped down where you can't access them. And then also we don't want those documents to be secured right over the ventilation because that decreases their ventilation ports and that's not good. And what we're looking for, we're looking for a written certificate that has the consigner's name, address, telephone number, what species of primate it is, the date and time when food and water were last offered, and then 24 hour instructions, specific instructions for offering food and water during the course of transport, and then the consigner's um, signature and date. We also need to have that health certificate um, and again, that health certificate should show that the animal was inspected by, by an accredited veterinarian within 10 days of transport. There are also some potentially required documents. Um, these are not required if they don't apply to your transport. However, if the primates are gonna be held in temperatures less than 45 degrees, they need to, be, they need to have a, a certificate of acclimation. Um, and the certificate of acclimation needs to specify the minimum temperature that they can be held at, and it needs to be signed and dated by a veterinarian within 10 days of transport. And there's no um, allowance for um, housing them above 85 degrees. It's just for below 45 degrees. And then if they're imported, you're gonna need to have your import permit and the CITES permit as well. And then in addition to those, there are some documents that are recommended to have. Um, we did talk about this yesterday, a transport plan. It's a really good idea to have a transport plan. Um, and in particular, have that contact information as part of your transport plan. Um, if the route needs to be altered, if the, um, who to contact, if the, there are delays in transport um, or anything along those lines. And then also if there's veterinary care requirements in route, who to contact for that veterinary care. It's also good to have an observation and feeding log um, that shows that the, that that activity has been done. It's a good way to, um, to show that. Um, also, it's, it, it's good to document the temperature in the cargo space um, that, that, that ensures that it's getting checked each time. Um, and it, so hopefully if it's venturing out of the range it's supposed to be in, it will be caught in a timely manner. Um, and, and this is just very good practice. Um, again, not required in the regulations, but good practice. When it comes to handling, um, when an animal is being moved to or from the transport conveyance, they need to be sheltered from sunlight, extreme heat, rain, and snow. They can't be exposed to temperature, temperatures above 85 degrees or before, below 45 degrees for more than 45 minutes during that transfer. Um, and again, there is an allowance for lower temperatures with a certificate of acclimation. The handlers that are moving the non-human primates need to avoid causing physical harm or distressing the animal. And then the enclosure itself must not be tossed, dropped, needlessly tilted, or stacked in a manner that results in falling. 
Now you may have noticed these guys had some PPE on, and that's because non-human primates always come with zoonotic disease concerns. Um, and there are pathogens that are of concern that humans carry uh, that are harmful to non-human primates. The example on the slide here is herpes simplex virus. 60 to 80% of the human population carry herpes simplex virus, and it is potentially fatal to many um, South American species in particular. Then there are viruses that affect both humans and non-human primates. Essentially, you're just as likely to get this from a person as you are from a primate. Um, they include um, measles and tuberculosis are two good examples of that. And then the last one are pathogens that are specifically carried by non-human primates and um, have the potential to cause significant illness in humans. And herpes B virus is my example of that one. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about herpes B virus um, it's specific to macaques, and macaques make up about 85% of the non-human primates that are held in captivity in the United States. So um, they're, much, they're a very big um, part of our primate population, and this is a very important pathogen. Um, it's estimated that about 80% of the macaques in the wild carry the virus. Uh, some of the research facilities do have B virus-free colonies. Uh, they continue to manage those primates as if they still potentially had B virus uh, because of the way that the virus behaves. Um, and, and, and like, how do I not go too technical on this? Just because of the way the virus behaves. And then roughly, and because it's a herpes virus, it's for life, it's, it's a gift for life. And um, so they will continue to carry this virus throughout their life. And roughly one to 3% of macaques that are carrying this virus will be shedding this virus at any given time. Um, another example to think about is like chickenpox. Um, chickenpox is another herpes virus and some people later in life will get shingles and that's because it's that same virus. So it's just hiding in your body. They like to hide out in your nervous system. Um, in macaques, um, they don't tend to show any clinical signs of disease. They may have um, an oral ulcer or a genital ulcer similar to herpes simplex, but they, it's very rare for them to even have that. So um, in, what we typically say is that a macaque that's shedding B virus looks exactly like a macaque that's not shedding B virus. The virus is shed in body fluids, particularly oral, ocular, and genital secretions. And then uh, it, gets, it can be transmitted um, when it crosses either your protective barrier of skin or when it contacts your mucous membranes. So that would be a mucous membrane exposure, a bite scratch where there's broken skin, a scratch again with broken skin, needle stick, um, or if there's an open lesion that gets contaminated with, with these fluids. So should you be transporting a macaque and you have a potential transmission or something that something's happened, you got a scratch, you're, you're concerned about it, what you should do is you should immediately wash the site for 15 minutes. And immediately means not when you're done feeding, not when you're done doing whatever you're doing, not when, not when you get to the next stop immediately. Um, what that does is uh, the herpes virus is protected by a lipid envelope. And so the soap breaks down that envelope and makes the virus susceptible to destruction. So it's so critical to get that soap and water um, on that site as soon as possible. And 15 minutes feels like a long time. It's the recommendation is 15 minutes by the clock. It's recommended that you time it because it will feel like two and a half hours, but it's really 15 minutes. Um, also milking the wound to encourage bleeding is, is um, recommended. What that does is that creates an outward flow of fluids so that, so that the virus isn't traveling in. It's, if it's close to the surface, it's being pushed out. And then mechanical scrubbing of the wound margins is recommended as well. For eyes or mucous membrane exposures, obviously you're not gonna be using soap because that would not be fun for anybody, um, but you wanna immediately flush the site with water or normal saline solution for a good 15 minutes or as long as you can stand it. it, it I don't know of anybody who can do that for 15 minutes. Um, after cleaning the, the site, uh, the, the exposed person really should be transported to a designated health services provider. Um, and it really should be somebody who knows something about B virus, which can be difficult. And um, they should be provided with a B virus fact sheet for the emergency room personnel. Um, that's having something like that put together and ready to go would be, would be very helpful 
in the event of an exposure. And then also um, when you get to the destination, it, it's good to notify the con consignee of the incident and see if they'll get a sample of the animal to see if they're shedding bee virus. We can't make them sample the animal, but, um, but they may be willing to sample the animal for you. In order to be able to do all these things, it's helpful to have a bite scratch kit on hand in the vehicle when transporting non-human primates. It should contain all the things that you need to deal with an exposure, including cleansing solution. Um, those sterile surgical scrub brushes are very handy. Um, they're sealed up, they've got soap on them, they're, they're moist, so, they're, so you, don't, you can scrub it up even if you don't have water available. Um, normal saline solution on hand. Uh, sterile exam gloves are recommended so that you don't get somebody helping somebody else and then they, get, they pick up B virus, maybe they have an open lesion. Uh, then that B virus fact sheet that, that you want your employee to take with them to the emergency room, have that in the emergency kit. <laughs> and a copy of um, any post in exposure instructions for your employee as well. Uh, there's other materials that, that um, people have felt are handy to have on hand and, and they include um, the list at the bottom there. The reason why we're so concerned about B virus is because it can be very serious in humans. Without antiviral treatment, it can be fatal in 80 to 90% of the people exposed. Early signs start with vesicular eruption, just like the vesicles or the, the blister-like lesions that you see with a herpes expo um, exposure. There may be pain, itching, or numbness at the, at the exposure site, and then um, regional lymphadenopathy or swollen and tender lymph nodes. The intermediate signs are a little bit of the generalized flu-like symptoms, fever, chills, malaise, and then also some of the neurologic signs that are starting to occur with progressive paresthesia um, from the exposure site, moving um, up, towards the, um, up towards the brain, possibly muscle weakness, if it was an eye exposure, conjunctivitis, and then when the virus gets to the brain stem, very serious signs, um, neck stiffness, stiffness, severe headache, double vision, loss of balance, leading all the way up to respiratory arrest. So very, very serious, very infrequently shed, but the appropriate precautions should be taken. And while, it is, while there are things you can do if you get exposed, it's even better to not get exposed. And one thing to do to avoid getting exposed is to wear all the appropriate personal protective equipment, um, including glasses or goggles, and wearing glass or goggles and a face shield is, is uh, required for imported non-human primates. An N95 mask for imported non-human primates. For domestically transported primates, a surgical mask may be okay, um, but it's gonna depend on the case. Bonnet, chemical resistant suit or Tyvek suit, especially one with long sleeves um, to protect your arms. Uh, wearing gloves, uh, double layer gloves, especially those cut resistant gloves, because a lot of times those um, those crates can have um, splinters on the outside that can grab your glove and tear your glove. So it's, it's, it's good to have those really durable gloves. And then of course, appropriate work shoes or work covers. And in addition to protecting yourself, you also wanna pay attention to fomites. You don't want to um, spread pathogens on your pen or your keys or other things that you're touching, might be touching while you're touching, working with the primates. Um, so maybe have a, have a designated set of those types of things in that you use in with the animals or wash your keys before, when you leave the primate area, if you need to take them in there and use them. The primary conveyance um, needs to be constructed in a manner that ensures the safety and comfort of each animal. It needs to have a, a sufficient supply of fresh air. And um, it also needs to prevent the entry of the exhaust from the engine because that is not good air for breathing. Uh, the enclosures need to be positioned so that that ventilation is getting into the enclosure. That the animals are protected from the elements and also they're not housed next to other animals that are gonna cause them distress like natural enemies. And then the, again, those temperature requirements between 45 and 85 degrees. And then the cargo space also needs to be kept clean and they, they can't be transported with um, materials that can cause them harm. I believe in the regs, the example is dry ice. They can't be 
transport with dry ice because that can be harmful. Now you haven't even left yet. <laughs> um, but you're close. Uh, final checks before any animals are transported, appropriate checks should be made to make sure that the recipients are ready and they're going to be ready to receive those animals when you get to the other end. Um, they should get an estimated time of arrival and be updated if there are going to be delays. Um, if you're going to be arriving outside of normal business or operating hours, um, you know, they might need to notify security staff for you to be able to get onto the premises. And while the receiving party should be the one to think of these things, it's you and your driver who are going to be inconvenienced if it doesn't get thought of. So it's just wise to make sure that they've thought of that and have communicated with their security team. And then also one final check to make sure that those animals are ready to go. So you're ready to hit the road. And we mentioned before that uh, non-human primates or all animals are not supposed to be accepted more than four hours before deport departure. And they also need to be offered food and water within four hours of departure. Traveling down the road. So we're down the road about eight hours. You can see the eye there. And that's because all primates must be observed at least once every four hours. And even though we're down the road only eight hours, it's been 12 hours since their last feeding. And the requirement is since the last feeding, not since the start of transport. So it is time to offer water to all the primates. And then if there are any primates in the shipment that are under one year of age, they need to be fed. I'm gonna go down the road another 12 hours. And it's been 12 hours again since watering and 12 hours again since your under one year old primates were fed and 24 hours since your over one year old primates have been fed. So now it's time to water and feed everybody. And then the pattern just repeats itself. And that's ground transportation. The requirements for air transportation are pretty similar, essentially the same, except um, if they can't access the cargo area, then the requirement is to check the animals during loading and unloading rather than checking them every four hours. So in the case of this 12 hour flight, in my example here, um, they would get fed and watered right before leaving and checked right before leaving. And then when they land, I have them getting fed and watered again. Even though it's only 12 hours, I have them feeding the over one year olds because it's right before they start off on that transport. So most transporters are gonna wanna start them off with being fully ready to go as, as long and as far as they can go. And then the ground transport's gonna shift accordingly. During transportation, um, primates should not be removed from their enclosure. There are, we do allow some exceptions. Um, that is, if the animal is to be placed in another enclosure or facility, or if the animal needs to be removed for the health or well-being. Uh, we also do have the requirement that if an animal is in obvious physical distress, they're provided with veterinary care as soon as possible. Uh, if a primate is to be removed during transportation, it can only be done by an experienced individual who has to remove that primate from their enclosure. For animals that are being imported, however, um, they should not be removed for their enclosure period. These are animals that have not been through a quarantine. Um, and so as soon as possible means when they get to the next CDC approved quarantine facility, um, that would be the next appropriate place to, to remove them from their enclosure. When you get to your destination, uh, it's important to attempt to notify the consignee immediately when you get there um, and document each notification attempt. It's wise to do this um, in writing. It's recommended to do it on the carrier's copy of the shipping document or the copy that accompanies the primary enclosure. It should include the date and time the contact was done, the method, the name of the person making the attempt, and when the consignee was actually notified. If um, the attempt is unsuccessful, the requirement is to make an effort to notify at least once every six hours. You can do it more often. You can also feed them more often and you can also check them more often during transport. Um, and then after 24 hours, the handler must return the animal to the consigner. If the consignee is notified, if, they're, if you are able to get a hold of them, but they're not able to accept delivery of the animal within 48 hours, then the handler 
needs to return the animal to the consigner as well. And I'm done, Shannon, so you can stop flashing me with number signals. <laughs> All right, so um, we were running a couple minutes behind and so we are going to give an additional five minutes, um, just like we did our last presenter and then we'll get back on track with the break and so um, if anyone has a question in the audience, please raise your hand if we have a Q and a um, on the virtual presentation put it, please put it in the zoom Q and a at the very bottom of the presentation. Any questions internally. Oh, we have one. Um, you mentioned the recommended paperwork for like feeding and observation logs. And I'm just wondering what USDA does um, for folks who might not be doing that. How do you know if transporters are providing those every four hour checks and the food every 12 hours or 24 hours for the adults? Well, we look to see that those that there are instructions on when it's supposed to be done. And then we look um, to see if there's evidence that it's being done. Is there remnants of food in the enclosure? Are the, is there water in the water dishes? Um, has the food contain, has the food that's been provided been opened during the course of transport? You know, there, there are definitely indicators that, that show us that it's not being done if it's not being done. Karen? What constitutes obs observed at least once every four hours? Does remote modern, modern monitoring with cameras count as observation? Were you able to hear that? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Okay. I'm thinking about it because it would be very difficult to monitor these guys with a camera because the mesh is so tight on their enclosures, it'd be hard to adequately see them to assess their health and well being, how they're doing. So I, I have a hard time imagining that that would be sufficient. It needs to be something that's sufficient to assess their health and well being. Thank you. Any other? Oh, here. Thank you, Dr. McGinnis. Your uh, points on uh, final checks and notifications alone were very helpful. Um, with regard to the final check on uh, determining that the animal is fit for transport, who should make that determination? What criteria? When should that determination be made? And should it be documented? I'm documenting is always the best practice, definitely for sure. Um, and it should it should be the shipper that's checking the animals. They're the ones that are there present. Um, you don't typically have a veterinarian. Some, some facilities do have a veterinarian going along with transport and that's wonderful, um, but not always. And it's not a requirement. And they need to be looking for those signs that we talked about in terms of training, the signs of uh, poor health, distress, issues of concern, and they should have good guidance in terms of when they need to reach out to a veterinarian when what they're seeing indicates an animal might not be fit for transport. All right, and Karen, I think we might have time for one more if you have one more. Sure, are there any plans for a reg or tech notes on transportation of neonatal primates like the one that was recently published for neonatal phalids? I would love to see something in terms of a minimum age for transport of non-human primates. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any specific, specific plans, but if I have an opportunity to advocate for that, I certainly will. Okay, great. You guys can put your hands together for Dr. Gwen McGinnis.